So I'm Marcos Cristante II. I'm CDW's Global Chief Information Security Officer. As you see here, I've got a diverse background uh, in cybersecurity. I've worked across a number of different industries, whether it's financial services, government, um, uh, uh, consulting, and also with the SAS organization as well. So today I'm going to cover two primary topics. Uh, the first part is some agile cyber defense strategies. So we're going to draw on parallels between the traditional battlefield as well as the digital battlefield. And then the second part, I'm going to introduce a new framework, a new way to think about uh, making decisions as, as, as you step upon different uh, cyber risks and big changes that you might need to make within your particular organizations. So taking a step back a bit, right, the cyber risk landscape continues to evolve, right, the, the, the pace and velocity of risk uh, continues to accelerate pace. And so what you see here is really a simplification of that. I've kind of broken this down into three different areas. So first and foremost, the complexity is driven by an acceleration in business transformations, right? As you all are embarking upon your organization's uh, objectives, your strategies, looking to maximize uh, growth to ensure that you're meeting the standards and requirements that your shareholders uh, expect of you, that's a big driver for this sort of increased uh, risk and velocity. The second is really around the sophistication of cyber threats. So when you think about cyber crime and what's happening, we're seeing these uh, cyber threat actors, they're starting to become more organized, right, with cyber crime as a service. We see this with phishing as a service, we see this with ransomware as a service, but then ultimately we still have nation state threats that we have to contend with. And then finally, we've got significant technology shifts, right, a relentless pace of innovation in AI, I'll try not to say AI too many times today, uh, cloud, and also with quantum computing, right? So there's, there's, there's a lot of different innovations that we've got to manage, and there's still a lot of legacy tech debt that we also have to make sure that we're controlling, overseeing, and, and evolving over time as well. So as, I, as we look at the unprecedented pace of change, as we look at the acceleration of these various cyber threats and this velocity continuing to increase, cybercrime has become the third largest economy in the world which is pretty substantial, right? So when you think about the GDP of cybercrime at $8 trillion per year, that's higher than the GDP of Germany, higher than the GDP of Japan, and almost half the GDP of China. So this pace will continue to increase. We've got a lot of different research and sort of estimates that are saying that by 2027, we're gonna see the increase of cybercrime reach $27 trillion. That's huge. So given this reality, right, we've got to think about what do we do? How do we, how do we become more agile? How do we take an approach where we can not try to match the, the complexities of this environment, but ultimately balance low cost, low effort ways to improve upon our cyber defenses? So I would say the answer to this question is not always found in technology. Absolutely, technology is going to help. We want to make sure that we've got the appropriate technology stacks that are going to take us to the next level, that are going to support our businesses. But often the answer is found in the strategies that we adopt. So when we think about the strategies, I like this quote by Theodore Roosevelt, which really, which really talks about understanding the past in order to inform the future. Meaning, at the same time, it's not binary. I know sometimes we think about, oh, we're, we're going to look too, too much at the past. We might not be uh, focused on the, the future. There's definitely unknown unknowns that we've got to you know, contend with, those sort of black swan events. But I think a lot can be learned by looking backwards. right? And so that's what we're going to do in part one of this, of this uh, presentation. So first off, how many of you have seen the movie uh, Napoleon? All right, not, not a lot, not a lot, so this should be fun. I, I won't give away any spoilers. Um, I looked at it a few weeks ago, and, and as I was going through it, I started to think about this presentation and you know, how Napoleon took a very agile approach, how Napoleon had some very interesting strategies to be successful on the battlefield. Right? He's history's one, one of the history's greatest strategists. He mastered the art of war, and he had a cunning ability really to overcome odds and to adapt to his terrain, as you think about that traditional battlefield. So we're gonna explore some of his lessons, some of the timeless lessons of Napoleon, some of the strategies, some of the principles uh, that he employed, and leveraging those to improve upon our cyber defenses in your own program at your companies. So here are the seven strategies by Napoleon. So we're gonna talk through terrain and how this relates to cybersecurity. We're gonna go over countermeasures, his use of scouts, 
and also how he took full advantage of his alliances. And so again, we're gonna look through the lens of cybersecurity. There's a lot here. Seven strategies, we're gonna unpack a lot. This is just part one of the presentation as well, and I'm gonna make sure I'm paying attention to time. But my goal for you is to not be overwhelmed by the number of things that we cover, but instead, pick two to three strategies that you might employ in your organization. So let's dive in. Okay, so strategy number one, strategic use of terrain. So Napoleon, he understood his physical terrain extremely well. He understood how could he use that terrain to his advantage. Controlling the high ground was a, a big tenet of his, right? It's an easier position to fight from when you're thinking about a sort of traditional battlefield. He also looked at his terrain, again, we're gonna get to the cyber piece of this, really to understand how does he strategically utilize and place his resources on that battlefield. He deeply understood that terrain, such that he can maximize his strategies, his defensive strategies and his offensive strategies. So you might think, what does this mean for cybersecurity? How do we apply this? So first, you can't protect what you don't understand, right? So to control your digital high ground, you really need to deeply understand your business. What are your key business motions? What are your key business objectives? How does data flow within your systems? How does data flow within your networks? What are your most important and critical assets, your, your crown jewels, if you will? And so my first call to action for you is you think about strategy number one. Really think through in advance how and where might cyber attacks occur within your environment, your, your, within your digital terrain, right? Think strategically about those data flows, your networks. Where are your, what are your most vulnerable points, whether it could be certain accounts, certain domains, certain systems? And then think strategically about how you might architect your network differently, how you might place capabilities, solutions, and, and controls in a different way such that you have a better advantage against this ever-evolving and increasing adversary. This is especially important now when you think about all of our networks today. They're quite mixed, right? We've got on-premises, we've got SaaS, we've got multi-cloud. And so strategy number two is surprise countermeasures. Napoleon's success, it really hinged on the element of surprise, right? He embraced this notion of unpredictability. He strategized on ways in which he could catch his enemies off guard. But this approach is not something that, I would say from a security perspective, we spend a lot of time on operations, right? Focusing on the threats du the jour, the, 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 the different um, um, initiatives and operational events or alerts that we need to manage. This approach requir really requires deep thought. It requires meticulous planning and then to execute on those, those strategies in a relentless way. So when you think about cybersecurity, you think about your digital battlefield, what are some countermeasures that you might employ to surprise your attackers, right? To turn the tables on the attackers. How often are you spending time, like Napoleon, in this sort of meticulous planning phase, workshopping and looking strategically at your architecture, at your environments, and trying to find ways to surprise your adversary, to surprise uh, them in such a way that makes their attacks much more difficult? You can think about this almost from a digital uh, minefield perspective, right? Such that when attackers get in, it's not a, not a matter of if anymore, right? It's a matter of when, they're unable to hide. And when, when they do get into your environments, you're able to uh, a, a, get alerted and an alarm would sound off such that your uh, teams are notified immediately. So the call to action here is to think strategically about what are some trip wires that you might use or might place within your systems. Right, so the first thing the attackers do is, and we see this a lot as we think about a lot of these different uh, breaches that are happening in the news and the headlines, they're either trying to uh, leverage some sort of double extortion attempt, right, where they're trying to steal data uh, from you before they go and encrypt your systems. So look for ways in which uh, you might uh, place certain decoy access keys within your network, right? These could be AWS access keys, if you're, if you're, you're an AWS shop, Azure or GCP or perhaps passwords to shared email accounts, such that if either of those things were used, again, your team will be alerted uh, immediately. One thing I'll say about this is this, is, this is especially important because attackers, they only have to be right once, right? One vulnerability, one phishing email, but us as defenders, we've got to get cybersecurity right all the time, 
right? We've got to make sure that you know, we cover all, all of the ground. So this really turns the table uh, from an attacker's perspective and, and really makes their job much more difficult. All right, strategy number three here. Uh, so this goes hand in hand with the second, right? So Napoleon used uh, surprise countermeasures, but he also mastered the art of misinformation and deception. Right, when you think about it, we see this in, in the election year that we're in today, right? Where we've got uh, a lot of people creating fake profiles, push, putting out fake narratives and headlines, often to try to sway narratives in, in, in one way or the other for, uh, to try to influence voting. But on the digital battlefield, these campaigns are much more strategic than those tripwires that I mentioned, right? You're, you're actually going much more further than, than placing these digital uh, landmines, but instead you're deploying full decoy systems. So you think back to you know, the notion of a Trojan horse, right? This is a digital Trojan horse that's set up for attackers such that when they do get in, the first thing that they see is that digital horse, that, that digital Trojan, Trojan horse, if you will. So my call to action here is to really think strategically about these digital decoys, uh, knowing that attackers will come in, they will look for your, your uh, sensitive data, sensitive systems. Consider perhaps creating a fake file server that you might put in place, right? This is sort of digital decoy, but instead it has dummy data. It doesn't have data that is production data or data that will lead to a, a leak or compromise of sensitive information. That way, when the attacker gets in, they, f they spend their time trying to copy that information as opposed to trying to find your crown jewel assets or your crown jewel systems. Now, on the other hand, there's one kind of word of caution, which is if not done appropriately or, 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 or thoughtfully, this might complicate both IT operations or even incident response. So really just thinking through how you deploy those digital decoys is, is uh, uh, extremely important. All right, so we're almost, almost done with these seven here, uh, again, being, being mindful of time. The next strategy here is around strategic allocation of your resources. So Napoleon used his resources extremely wisely, right? He didn't overextend his forces, and he ensured that he was focused on the most critical objectives and protecting the most critical vulnerable points within his digital or his traditional terrain, right? Making sure that he maintained those high value positions along that uh, traditional battlefield. But so what does it mean on the digital battlefield? From a cybersecurity perspective, we're now talking about allocation of resources appropriately. This is your people, this is your technology, this is your personnel, and making sure that you're not spending, or, or I would say um, uh, spreading resources too thinly uh, w within your organization. You may have heard the term before, if everything is a priority, nothing is a priority, right? And so in the cyber domain, we've got so much that we've got to contend with. That this is sometimes challenging, right, to, to really strike this balance. So it really starts by applying a common baseline, a common security baseline. What are those core controls that you need to meet, regardless of the system, regardless of the network, regardless of the environment? And then identifying what enhanced controls that you need to apply on your most critical assets, those critical crown jewels. And then over time, what you want to do is you want to scale those enhanced controls such that you're raising that baseline over time against all of your, your assets. So my call to action is to really think through the processes, uh, I'm sorry, the people, the, the resources and, and the processes that you might want to focus on. And from a people perspective, watch for burnout. You know, in, in this industry that we're in, we're under a lot uh, of, of, of attacks and, and stress. Uh, and so it's really important to understand um, you know, those most important uh, critical resources and having retention plans in place ensuring that you understand what their critical goals are and you're, you're, you're appropriately rewarding them as they're achieving those goals in balance with what they're trying to achieve uh, professionally. Equally, looking at your most critical assets, right, those crown jewel systems that I mentioned, and ensuring that you're applying enhanced monitoring. That could be monitoring of accounts, that could be monitoring of the installed software, that can be looking at process execution, or even file integrity if you want to uh, apply some additional uh, controls towards that. All right, uh, strategy number five, the supply chain. Um, so Napoleon sustained his campaigns really well by protecting his supply lines, right? So in the traditional battlefield, this includes the delivery of things like ammo, right, of food, of supplies, especially critical given the long and drawn out battles that, you know, that, that went on for a long period of time. You think about the cyberspace, we're, we're in a continuous battle as well. 
And so protecting those, those routes was keenly important for Napoleon. So when you think about your organizations, your organizations are thriving by relying upon its critical supply chain, right? In cybersecurity, you want to ensure that you're protecting the veins of your organization's operations by looking at the, 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 the software supply lines, the, the business vendors, and understanding the risk as it pertains to those, and ensuring that they're implementing the appropriate controls as well, because they are a part of your supply chain. They are a part of that supply line that you want to protect. And so it's the business supply line, it's the technology supply line, the third party uh, libraries that you might be using within your source code. It's also your security stack, right? Understanding the security controls of the programs that are in place at the companies that are writing the software that is protecting your organizations from a security perspective. So how well do you know or understand uh, your critical business vendors? You know, which serve as the highest risk and could potentially be a point of entry into your organization, a potential backdoor into systems, a backdoor into applications. You want to understand these such that you are able to protect your critical business supply line. So that's my call to action uh, for you here, which is if you don't know who your most risky vendors are, conduct an analysis. Refresh your top risky supplier list. Make sure you understand the maturity of their controls and you're holding them accountable to addressing those controls. One thing I'm going to talk about in a little bit is around concentration risk. So as we think about concentration risk, that's equally important from a third party risk perspective, right? How much are we concentrating risk within certain suppliers, certain vendors, certain technology platforms? The next strategy is use of scouts. So Napoleon used scouts really to understand and gather intelligence, intelligence about his enemy's positions, intelligence about their movements. Think of this as really your eyes and ears, right? Giving you a strategic uh, advantage such as you understand what these threat actors are doing. This is, this is key in, in terms of really bolstering uh, a cybersecurity program. So in the digital realm, this, the scouts here, this is your threat intelligence partners, your threat intelligence providers, right? And I'm not talking about just tactical threat intelligence like an IP address. Attackers will change their IP address uh, relatively quickly in, in most cases. But understanding their behaviors, understanding the procedures, understanding what they're doing, such that you can, you can um, uh, appropriately apply countermeasures to those actions over time. So I would say in terms of the call to action here, every organization is going to be at a different level of maturity when it comes to threat intelligence gathering. You know, some, some are collecting threat intelligence um, uh, in, a, in a more robust way, um, and I would say it, that's great. You want to continue to do that, but look for ways to automate deployment of countermeasures, you know, reducing the time it takes from collecting or ingesting threat intelligence to deploying those countermeasures to your solutions, both at the edge and at the endpoint. That's, that's extremely critical. And, but then if you're not collecting threat intelligence, consider subscribing to either free or, or paid services such that you can stay apprised of what these threat actors are doing. That will absolutely help you to, to boast your security programs. All right, number seven, the final strategy here really is on alliances and coalition building. So Napoleon sought out and he forged alliances really to, to strengthen uh, his, his campaigns on the battlefield. He understood this concept of this notion of strength in numbers and really used his alliances as a force multiplier across uh, the battlefield. So in cybersecurity, this is all about collaboration, right? It's all about information sharing. It's all about getting to collective strength, collective defense. Um, you know, if you, if you think about it, uh, well, let me just describe some of the examples here. So there's, there's a wide variety of groups that you can uh, join, whether it's the different you know, ISACs, the information uh, sharing community, communities that are out there. There's a lot of uh, government entities, depending upon your industry, uh, that they want to partner with you to make sure that uh, you're staying apprised of what they're seeing, they're staying apprised of what you're seeing. Uh, to, and in some cases, they do provide free resources as well. So building these partnerships is absolutely key. So if you're not already involved uh, in those organizations, I encourage you highly to participate. Uh, whether it's in forums, whether it's in uh, these different ISACs, whether it's in with, with, with those different government organizations that I mentioned, we think about cyber attackers, they share information all the time. I don't think we do enough really to share uh, across the industry. Um, you know, I see someone shaking their head, yes. Uh, if you think about it, if every person in this room today 
found one other company, one other organization and said, look, we're going to start collaborating. We're going to start, we're going to work with our legal teams, right? <laughs> and we're going to start uh, sharing uh, threat intelligence. Imagine what kind of collective defense and collective strength that, that would do for our community. All right, again, we're not doing enough of this today. So those are the seven strategies, leveraging Napoleon's approach, leveraging his agile uh, mindset. And again, I encourage you to, to, to leverage a couple, you know, look for one or, or two or three that might make sense for you and your organizations and to take those back, whether it's identifying and securing your crown jewel assets, whether it's strategically looking for where to place tripwires within your organization or forging an alliance uh, with another organization, a government entity or, or, or otherwise. So that's part one. Ready for part two? I know that was a lot. I was told it was a lot of content. It is. I geek out on this stuff, if you can't tell. Uh, okay, so part two, we're going to cover a uh, new framework for how to think about risk and making decisions when it comes to, to risk. Right, so as you navigate the complexities of the cyber risk landscape, you're often going to be faced with a variety of inflection points. And these inflection points are big decisions that you need to make about your program, right? And ultimately, the outcome of that decision might shift the trajectory of your security program, which we'll, which we'll, we'll kind of go into. The key, though, is to make sure that you are uh, exploring the right questions and that you're looking through the right lenses such that you don't miss anything and that you're thinking uh, in, in depth about this. So the framework to support this process is what I call ROSA. Uh, this is not meant to be prescriptive, meaning I'm not going to give you a matrix with you know, weights and uh, uh, you know, heat maps that you need to use. But ultimately, every organization is going to be different, right? The, the technology that you use is going to be different. Your business context is going to be different. The weighting that you might apply to certain questions might be different. But the key is to make sure you're looking at it through these different lenses in a way that you are um, effectively analyzing the, the different approaches that you might take as you're, as you're facing these different inflection points. Now, later in the year, we will be publishing more detail on this uh, framework, such that if you decide, hey, I want to leverage this in a qualitative way or a quantitative way, uh, that will be there for you. But today, we're going to go over three core questions that you can then answer for each dimension of this ROSA framework. Okay, so the R in ROSA stands for risk, right? So as we walk through this, we're gonna go through a use case. Um, and this is an interesting use case. Let, let's say that you are faced with the decision to consolidate your technologies within a particular platform, right? We hear a lot about this in the industry these days where a lot of companies are pushing on, uh, we've got a lot of tools and that's true, um, maybe we should consolidate with you know, this new platform stack. Naturally, you hear the big pitch for their platform stack, right? And so you might decide, you know, does that make sense for your organization or not? Um, it's definitely not a bad thing, right? We do have a lot of tools in, in our environments. We want to make sure that we are simplifying uh, the technical support. Uh, we don't want to create a lot of sprawl. We want to manage the licenses that we have. But a full-on platform consolidation may or may not be right for, uh, you know, your organization. We'll kind of talk through, you know, why that might be. Okay, so the first question that you want to go through is understanding the impact to your organization's risk posture, right? So if you think about the risk in your environment, how many of you are uh, using a risk register to manage your risk? Yeah, we all have a variety of risks that we need to, to manage, different controls, solutions that we need to, to enhance. Um, and so when you think about this question, it could be based upon evaluating the control maturity against something like a NIST framework, or perhaps the critical security controls, or if you're deeply involved in evaluating application security, it could be the OWASP uh, application security verification standard. You might also look at it from a perspective of if I was to go down this path with this solution or this consolidated platform, will it help me address key themes that I'm identifying within our penetration testing findings? Right? Because ultimately, that's what you should be looking at improving upon over time. Now, again, you, when you think about this sort of framework, you can also get more granular, looking at uh, risk ratings, the impact and likelihood uh, scenarios. 
uh, but ultimately ensuring that you're, you're rooted, rooting these decisions and understanding the impact on um, the, the macro changes to your cybersecurity program. The second question speaks to the impact on threat and vulnerability management, right? So if you think about a platform uh, play uh, in this case or, 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 or a big decision within your program, will this resolve classes of vulnerabilities such that you have none of these vulnerabilities to deal with anymore? Will it help you resolve uh, classes of threat techniques in such a way that it's gonna address some of the key techniques that you're worried about from a threat actor perspective? Likely in a lot of cases, when you think about uh, threat techniques or classes of vulnerabilities, it's not a security solution that's gonna solve that for you. It's ultimately a business change to a business process or a set of, set of security processes. The other aspect is understanding security of security. I don't think we, th we don't talk about that enough in, in, in cybersecurity, right? So will this change be leading to more vulnerability or more threats as it pertains to our own program and our ability to manage the access that we might have into key production systems? That's another key, key component to consider. And so the last question in this dimension here is around uh, understanding um, compliance, right? Whether it's legal uh, compliance, whether it's regulatory compliance, whether it's compliance with your customer requirements. I've got insurance listed here. Often your broker is gonna have preferred vendors that you, you, you need to uh, consider, right? So that might be a key input as you start to embark upon the decision around consolidation. And then if you're global, of course, data residency is another key dimension, right? You might think that, well, I'm, I'm in the cloud, I can select uh, where we're, we're placing that data within a certain uh, region uh, and the like. But you also wanna consider the support that's being provided on the back end of that, right? Are those uh, vendor supports, uh, support personnel offshore, which could, which could lead to additional constraints from a compliance perspective. The second lens here is focused on operations, right? So the first piece is understanding the business operations. When you think back to your sales motions, your business processes and so forth, is security becoming a friction point for your employees? Is it slowing you down from a business perspective? Um, is that particular platform employee facing? Will it allow your employees to move faster but yet in a secure way? The next question is understanding uh, the, the technical components of it as well. So when we think about the technology operations, will downtime of that particular platform, if for example it's in line, will it lead to impact on your production assets? Will it slow the business down, which ultimately might lead to um, you know, financial impact? Minutes matter in, in our organizations. And so the final question on ops is around external dependencies. And this speaks to the question of um, concentration risk, right? As I talked about earlier, I wanted to kind of spend some, some time here. I think, how many of you have heard about change healthcare and what happened with change healthcare? Yeah, so change healthcare was significant, right? We're talking cascading systemic risk across the healthcare uh, industry. We had uh, providers that were unable to use billing and to, to handle payments. We had insurance companies that were unable to process claims. And we had businesses, whether it was major hospitals or, or small providers, unable to make payroll. And in some cases, uh, uh, unable to cover all their operational uh, fees. I, I heard that uh, some of the CEOs of these organizations were tapping into their personal banking accounts. So when we think about I guess the other point there is too is uh, this was exacerbated by the fact that Change Healthcare, Change Healthcare had acquired a number of companies and essentially became a single point of failure for healthcare transactions, right? And a lot of these different medical providers, they were left with no alternatives. They had no backup options. So pretty significant. So when you think about platforms and consolidation, this is something to consider. Right, so how are you balancing efficiencies and cost savings or perhaps concentration risk that might be resident in your organization? All right, so the next rows of lens is strategy, right? So this one's very important. I think maybe more important than the first two. If done well, this helps your security not be viewed as a cost center, but viewed as an enabler for your business. 
which can ultimately help with budget uh, as well. Everything you do in your cybersecurity program should be done in line to the lens of business from your company's strategy and your company's business objectives. So you might be thinking, well, my company isn't in the business of cybersecurity, right? We're in retail, we're in financial services uh, and the like. But think about it from a customer perspective. We all have customers that we need to support and supply chain risk, it continues to be a challenge and one that every organization is more worried about. And so if, you're, if your customer has a decision to make and all things being equal except for security and your security program is known and has a track record for, for strong data security, I think that might be the right choice, right? I would choose your company uh, in that case. So the next question is focused on partnerships and alliances. Uh, so going back to Napoleon a little bit here, right? Every decision that you make, every large scale purchase specifically has an impact potentially on your partnerships and your alliances. So of course we can't please everyone, but this is, some, this is very important to make sure that we're, we're, we're thinking about this as we make these decisions and then we're managing the expectations of our partners and, and, and those expect, expectations of, um, uh, of what they have of you and your program and that overall alliance. I'm going to speed up here. I'm coming a little bit short on time. Uh, so the last question on strategy is around vision. So we think about Wayne Gretzky, right? Wayne, Wayne Gretzky's uh, sort of skate to where the puck is going. This is all about visualization. It's all about anticipation, really understanding the strategy of your organization. If you're looking to expand locations, if you're looking at uh, mergers and acquisitions, if you're looking at uh, potentially going into new geos, it might then have uh, additional regulatory requirements really understanding where that's going, understanding your security North Star, North Star and making sure that your uh, consolidation decision, right, going back to that use case, is balanced and managed uh, through that lens as well. All right, so we're on the last lens here, right, which, are, which is around agility. So the first question is uh, understanding your ability to adapt. Right, we talked about the cyber threat landscape continuing to evolve, to continue to accelerate pace, uh, to continue to increase in velocity. So when you're thinking about that use case of consolidation, is this platform going to give you the ability to flex? Right? If, if, you're, if your business, if, 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 you're, uh, if the threat landscape uh, is increasing the amount of alerts that your team needs to manage, are you going to be able to then manage those alerts in a better way? Should you know, you consolidate your platform. Are you able to scale new employees or influx of new employees should your company decide it wants to acquire a, a new business? Is it going to make that process more easy for you? Or perhaps is it going to require a lot of refactoring and reengineering? And finally, the last question on agility is lock-in. Right? As you know, some technology companies, they do become complacent right? Uh, they, they might slow their, their ability to innovate. And so thinking about lock-in is important here, right? As, as, as you invest in a platform, uh, as you consolidate, you want to make sure that you're, you're still able to innovate. So understanding the, the, the organizations that you partner with and their ability to be agile uh, and, and to make those strategies align to that uh, ability to avoid lock-in uh, such that you can have that flexibility and scale is important. I know this was a lot. So this was the Rosa framework, right? I hope you found some value. And again, it's not meant to be prescriptive, but really as a guide as you think about these big decisions that you need to make, uh, and, and you can look at it through these different lenses. So the last thing I will say in my final minute, I would be remiss if I didn't say that CDW can help you strike that balance between uh, balancing business agility and security. I think you all know by now, CDW is not just a reseller, right? We implement and we deploy solutions. We're an integrator. Yes, we do managed services. Uh, many of you may have heard uh, me talk a bit about you know, consultants or, or consulting uh, in, in the past. Um, you may have heard you know, me, me make the statement, too, that consultants often borrow your watch to tell you the time. <laughs> it's true. But CDW, although we advise and consult, we do so much more. As, as described here, and, and that is all powered by CDW Solutions Intelligence, right? So we provide the bridge between technology complexity and clarity for your environment, clarity for your program. And that clarity is rooted in the business context 
of your mission. That clarity is rooted in the 250,000 customers that we have and that we manage from an engagement perspective. That way we can ensure the appropriate fit for whatever goals that you have, whether it's innovation, whether it's transformation, uh, or whether it's optimization. That is the CDW difference. And with that, I'm out of time. Thank you.